what I'm going to talk about is, as explained, I, I used the uh, title Agency Costs Real, Imagined and Real, but really the, um, you know, the conflicts of interest that arise and um, where the focus is and perhaps where it should be in this regard. Now, um, I, I think we're all familiar with the standard narrative about the global financial crisis, which is that the rating agencies were a major, if not the major, culprit in this uh, catastrophe. Uh, they gave AAA ratings to mortgage-related uh, uh, collateralized debt obligations that clearly did not deserve uh, those high ratings. And the unsuspecting financial institutions that bought those deals uh, suffered gigantic losses that threatened their solvency, touching off a uh, systemic crisis. Now, uh, first of all, the um, unsuspecting institutions should have suspected something because a lot of those uh, so-called AAA securities yielded 200 basis points more than other AAA securities. Uh, so uh, it was very interesting to see the uh, financial institutions migrate very quickly from uh, we don't rely on the rating agencies, we do our own research to we relied on the ratings and look what happened. Um, and uh, this is one of the, the um, themes I'll come back to, but the um, uh, the motivations behind some of the rhetoric, rhetoric that you hear, and uh, clearly there is a, a motivation for money managers to uh, downplay the extent to which they depend on ratings because they want to look like they're adding value. And uh, the, uh, but it, we saw in the, in, in the uh, financial crisis, they changed their tune very quickly. Now the. Uh, Conventional, uh, well, the question, though, is really why do, uh, did these ratings get uh, awarded inappropriately? Uh, and the conventional answer is that the fact that the ratings are paid for by the issuers being rated, which creates a clear conflict of interest. And if that problem, uh, if that conflict is a problem for mortgage-related securities, then clearly it must also be a problem for corporate uh, related uh, securities. And this viewpoint was colorfully expressed by my former neighbor, uh, now senator from Minnesota, Al Franklin, uh, formerly of Saturday Night Live, uh, who um, uh, said, well, uh, oh, this, this structure in the rating uh, industry is awful. I mean, uh, the, the, the companies who are being rated are the ones paying for the ratings. You know, this is comparable to your kid coming back from school and saying, I got an A on my chemistry test because I gave the teacher $100. And uh, the fact is, it's not like that at all. And uh, I can uh, attest to that because uh, my children went to private schools here in New York City. They're uh, quite expensive. Um, they were not paying the teachers, but I was. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, uh, contrary to what you would infer from Senator Franken's logic, the, uh, they're not awarding A's uh, simply. Uh, the grading scale, with all due respect to the present uh, company, is tougher than in most colleges uh, in the United States. Um, there, there's no talk of grade inflation uh, that I've heard at these schools. And uh, there's a clear reason why there isn't, because they would not, uh, as secondary schools, have credibility with the admissions officers at the uh, universities if they were giving out grades that were not uh, deserved. And uh, so the point is that the fact that there is a conflict of interest does not automatically demonstrate that that conflict cannot be successfully managed. And that's the leap that I, I, I would, uh, although, I, I mean, Senator Frank has gotten good marks for being a, a, a real grunt uh, as far as uh, doing his homework, and so it probably deserves uh, some credit in other respects. But I think in, the, in this point, uh, which just echoes the comments of many others uh, on this, um, really it's, it's not enough to simply assert a hypothesis, you have to go out and collect some evidence to support it. And um, so uh, what I'm going to uh, do today is to first show that the issuer pay model does not create a problem in the corporate bond ratings. Uh, second, that there are uh, important differences between mortgage-backed securities and corporate, uh, the corporate markets uh, that explain why the conflict was a problem in the mortgage area but not a problem in the, uh, the corporate area. And third, that the most important but overlooked problem of the issuer pay model in corporate bonds is the uh, effective 
corporate uh, or issuer pay structure in corporate bond underwriting, and not in the rings, but in the uh, the underwriting of the bonds. So um, these are the uh, key points I want to make. You know, are is the issuer pay model irretrievably corrupt? Um, the differences between mortgage backs and corporates, and that the the problem really is more on the underwriting side. So uh, let me tackle first the uh, issue of corporates versus, versus uh, mortgage-backed securities. And uh, I think you get an understanding of that by comparing some of the dynamics in the market. In the corporate area, there are literally thousands of issuers. As of uh, the beginning of 2014, uh, there were 5,340 corporate issuers uh, in the Moody's universe. And uh, what that means is that no single issuer is a material portion of the revenue of the rating agency. So in that respect, their leverage uh, uh, to influence the ratings is quite limited. Um, the other uh, important factor here is that the issuer needs the money, uh, has to go to the bond market to get it, and cannot go to the bond market without uh, ratings. Uh, of at least the, uh, two major rating agencies, often uh, Fitch uh, being the third, along with Moody's and Standard and Poor's. So uh, they really um, don't have much ability to uh, hold anything over the rating agencies, saying, well, we're not going to pay unless we get the rating we want, or we're going to go to the other guy and get a better rating, uh, because we really have to go to uh, both of them, or, or even all three of them. So the competition uh, to sort of drive down the quality of ratings really doesn't exist in this market. Now, mortgage backs, uh, it is a different story. Uh, first of all, uh, you don't have thousands of issuers. You have a relatively small number of organizing banks who have the ability to put together one of these structured finance deals. And each of them does represent a significant portion of the revenue of the rating agency, so they do have uh, more leverage. It's also not the case that uh, an issuer necessarily has to get ratings from both uh, or all three of the ra uh, major rating agencies. So there is more of an opportunity to play one agency off uh, against another. And most importantly, um, in, where in, in contrast to the corporate market where once I've decided I'm going to raise the money, uh, I've got to go and borrow it with the rating that I get, whatever it is, even if I, I always think it should have been higher. Uh, but uh, in the uh, mortgage-backed market, uh, if there is not a AAA rating on the most senior tranche in the structure, there will be no deal. And that means there will be no revenue to the rating agencies. So uh, you can see that it's going to be a tougher conflict when the rating officers are uh, 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 influenced in some way, and uh, there have been some reforms to try to control this, but. Ultimately, if the revenue uh, fl uh, flows into the compensation, there is going to be a temptation to award uh, better uh, than deserved ratings in order to get the deal done and have the revenue flow. So uh, this, by the way, was a conflict that was recognized at the very outset. I have a uh, friend who was a senior person at one of the rating agencies back at that time who had done quite well in the corporate area and was offered the opportunity to get in on the ground floor when uh, the mortgage uh, ratings began to be a uh, new growth business and he politely declined because he foresaw this exact kind of a problem and didn't really want to jeopardize his career at that point. <clears throat> um, now, uh, the, the other uh, point to keep in mind is that while um, uh, these pressures exist and uh, you could theorize that uh, they exist even in the corporate area. On the other side, there is some uh, desire, some motivation for the rating agencies to preserve the reputation, the credibility of their ratings. Uh, namely that the, uh, the only reason for uh, investors ultimately to use the ratings uh, is that they, they are credible. Now, the uh, government has come into it, has written ratings into uh, standards of credit quality, and that does complicate the issue. But even there, uh, if they lost enough credibility, they would be de-recognized as uh, nationally recognized uh, 
uh, securities ratings organizations and supplanted by someone else. So that there is a, a, a reason, uh, a value, and I, uh, perhaps they even have professional pride. You know, we don't have to talk about that, but uh, you know, if, if there isn't a compelling reason to compromise their uh, standards, uh, why not do it honestly? Um, and the, uh, the test, though, is only what, what do we actually see happen in, uh, in the market? Um, well, um, there's actually uh, pretty good evidence of uh, well-controlled, uh, 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 good control of the uh, issuer-pay conflict in the corporate market. And um, uh, just by the way, of the background, the first uh, uh, comment I'll give you about this is that the issuer pay model succeeded the investor pay model. And how did the investor pay model? Well, going back to 1909, when John Moody first started rating bonds, uh, he published a book. And uh, investors, institutions, uh, primarily banks uh, in those days, bought the book. And that was the source of getting the ratings. And uh, it was quite valuable to have that information. They were willing to pay a lot to get that book. Um, they later did it in a monthly bond guide, and uh, this was still pretty uh, prevalent when I started in the business, although the issuer pay model had come into place by that time, uh, but they were still followed a lot. Well, even the severest critics of the rating agencies acknowledged that going back to the investor pay model is a non-starter. In the internet age, it would be impossible to keep control over the information of what the ratings are in, uh, in a, such a way that would enable you to charge people for the, uh, the rating. So just um, as, as you think about this issue, uh, put out of your mind the idea that there's any possibility of changing, although that hasn't stopped congressmen from suggesting that we should revert to that model. It, it, it is absolutely not going to happen. Well, uh, Moody's earlier this year came out with a study and uh, let me just quote you uh, one of their conclusions, but they dealt with several issues that have been sort of chronic criticisms. Are finance companies rated uh, similarly? In other words, is the default risk of a finance uh, company rated single A the same as an industrial rated single A? And actually, they, they came up with pretty good evidence to support that. But on the point that we're um, addressing today, they wrote, quote, the accuracy of credit ratings has not declined since 1970 when Moody's adopted the issuer pays model. Default rates for issuers rated investment grade have in fact declined since Moody's switched its business model from investor pays to issuer pays. And uh, what that shows is that uh, you know, they didn't, uh, as a result of this uh, inferior kind of model, suddenly become corrupt and uh, hand out uh, ratings uh, more liberally than they had previously. And um, uh, th this, uh, uh, by the way, uh, this improvement, uh, I wouldn't go as, as so far as to say that it was a result of the switch to the issuer pay model. I think it's the result of better uh, analytical techniques, more resources, uh, better information, uh, perhaps uh, better disclosure, uh, a combination of things. But the important point is that the change in the model did not offset those and uh, cause uh, the uh, uh, quality to go in, in the other direction. Now, um, some uh, specific evidence on the output of the uh, process under the issuer pay model. This um, uh, covers uh, the basically the past 30 years. And uh, what you see is that there is no history. In, now, this is in the corporate market specifically. Uh, you see no evidence of uh, AAA bonds in the space of a year or two going into default, as we saw in the uh, mortgage-backed area. Uh, the default rate is not 0.00% over a long period of time, over a one-year period it is, but over a long period of time, some AAA corporations have lost their competitive position. Uh, some of them uh, got downgraded few notches and then did a leverage transaction that knocked the rating down even further and made them vulnerable to default as any uh, company with a speculative grade rating, BA1 or lower, uh, would be. Um, but what we do see is a monotonic increase in the 
probability of default within one year of this rating being assigned or in place, and uh, uh, with each step down the rating scale. So I would submit that um, the, uh, the rating agencies must be doing something right, uh, and most importantly for our present purposes, that the rating agencies could not produce this performance record if they were assigning ratings according to who is willing to pay the most uh, or give them the most business in order to get the highest possible rating. Uh, you know, it just wouldn't be possible to keep, uh, keep everything uh, straight and you know, uh, figure out which ratings had to be lower so the other ones could be higher and, and all, the, all the rest. Um, uh, now another uh, comment that uh, you hear is that uh, we know that the ratings are wrong um, because the market often disagrees with them. Why there are some B1 bonds that yield more or have larger uh, spreads over treasuries than some B2 bonds. So, well, it's obvious that the, the, uh, they're, they're wrong. And as we know, the market is always right. That's the true arbiter. Now, these same people will turn around and say, uh, the way we add value is by finding where the, uh, the uh, uh, you know, the market is wrong. And, you know, that's, we, we buy undervalued bonds. So there's a great inconsistency. I seem to be the only person who has pointed this out uh, with little effect. Uh, you know, I've point, made this point for many years, you know, no one really cares about it. But it's, you know, quite a um, significant, uh, uh, you know, contradiction. Uh, and uh, the... Um, uh, well, here is uh, uh, the actual evidence on it, um, which is that, again, if, uh, I, here I'm focusing just on the um, speculative grade market because it'll be a little harder to see if you bring in the whole scale of the um, investment grade as well. But the, these, these numbers uh, also apply there. Um, again, with uh, on a monotonic basis, with, with, with each step down the rating scale, the market assigns a larger risk premium. Uh, so, in fact, uh, for the most part, the market agrees uh, with the rating agencies. Uh, now, there is overlap, and uh, there are good reasons why there should be, because the default risk is not the only, or default probability is not the only factor in the valuation of a particular bond. Uh, the uh, expected recovery and the event of default also enters into it. There are uh, features such as covenants in the bonds that will influence the pricing. Uh, there's also the uh, issue of liquidity. A smaller issue will tend to trade at a wider spread than a larger issue, particularly if it's a small issue of a company that doesn't have any other issues in the market because uh, there's more uncertainty, fewer abilities to uh, arbitrage bonds, uh, one bond uh, of the issuer versus another. So there's just less depth in the market. And all of those th things enter into the um, the pricing. Now, the other very important point that, again, I, I think I'm the only one who's uh, drawn attention to this, um, is that the, the critics who say, well, the, the ratings, uh, the spreads don't agree with the ratings, completely ignore uh, the very important factor of watch listings and rating outlooks. Uh, for every issue uh, that is rated by Moody's and Standard & Poor's and by Fitch, they publish either a watch listing saying that we're go uh, likely going to reduce the rating and give you some indication by how much it's likely to decline or upgrade it uh, based on some pending information. So typically uh, there's a transaction on the table to acquire the company that's going to affect the credit quality, uh, but they don't know if the deal is going to go through or not, so they're just putting out a warning and saying that uh, if that goes through, the company will be upgraded or downgraded, as the case may be. The market is clearly not going to wait until that happens. It will at least sign a, pro a probability and say, all right, it's, it should be, if, if the, pro if the uh, possibility is that it will be downgraded, then uh, there's a 50 or 60 whatever percent chance that it will be at B3 and should be priced that way as opposed to the present B1, and the spread will reflect that. Uh, they also have outlooks. Uh, for companies that don't have anything particular on the table right now, but the trend seems to be over the next you know, year, 18 months or so, uh, the likelihood is that the rating will be going either higher or lower. Well, if you no ignore that evidence, then uh, yes, uh, it, it looks sort of chaotic uh, when you get down below the, 
these median levels uh, of how particular issues are priced uh, relative to ratings. Uh, what we did here was an analysis that, um, as of the end of the first quarter, looked at all of the uh, issues rated B1 at the senior level and uh, in the uh, B of A Merrill Lynch U.S. High Yield Index. And just to explain, B1 uh, is uh, the blended rating scale uh, that they use in, in the Maryland, B of A Merrill Lynch system to uh, merge the Moody's and S&P and Fitch ratings. <clears throat> so uh, we said, all right, we want to make all of these comparable. We'll have no other intervening factors. So they're rated the same and they are all in the same uh, priority level in the capital structure. And then we uh, created this uh, little matrix here and said, all right, the option adjusted spread, uh, is it greater or less than the median of all of the bonds in that category. And uh, so you have four possibilities. If you add up the ones in which the market essentially agrees with the rating agencies, you get the case in the um, northeast quadrant where the, um, uh, the outlook is favorable and the risk premium is smaller than the median for that uh, group of bonds. And in the southwest quadrant, you have the case where the outlook or watch listing is negative and the risk premium is greater than the median. And in nearly 75% of the cases, and in other cases, uh, when we've run tests like this, we've had numbers of over 80 or even 90% agreement between the rating agencies and the market. So I would say that this idea of a lack of correspondence and this being some sort of evidence that the ratings are inherently wrong um, is really not upheld when you do a fair test, which is not necessarily what people are looking to do. Um, you know, they're not uh, trying to get an objective measure, they're trying to justify what they're, um, they're doing in the marketplace. Um, now, um, I don't want to uh, suggest that the uh, rating agencies are perfect. <clears throat> um, uh, and uh, they, uh, you know, they're, they're human, they're fallible, they have limitations to their methodologies. And uh, one uh, uh, way that, um, uh, that uh, you can find some uh, imperfection in the system is uh, to look at the sort of reverse. What I've talked about up till now is, well, how, does, uh, how well do they capture the risk of default? You know, the ultimate downgrade in the company going to D, not being able to pay its debt. Well, how about the other direction where they are potentially improving? And how can you measure whether they're uh, you know, they're uh, rating those bonds correctly. A little harder than uh, when you have the uh, concrete event of a company defaulting on its debt, and then you can measure how the risk premiums related and how well they predicted that event. Um, but there is some vali validity to another criticism that's made by the practitioners, which they'll say, you know, I want to own the bonds of XYZ Corp because my analysis indicates that its credit quality is on par with single B. Uh, companies, which is typical of what I invest in, but my investment guidelines prohibit me from buying a bond that's rated triple C, and unfortunately this uh, company has not been upgraded yet, even though my analysis indicates that it should be upgraded. So uh, let's see, um, here is the case, here is the market uh, identifying the bonds that in fact ought to be upgraded, and uh, so the test that we did here was we created a test sample uh, rated triple C1, again that's neither a Moody's or an S&P rating, but it's a blending of the two notation systems. And they were all senior unsecured bonds. And uh, on our test date, the option adjusted spread, uh, the median in that category was 592 basis points. So we um, looked at the uh, bonds that, uh, all the bonds in that sample uh, in that universe that had an option adjusted spread less than the median. And then our control sample <clears throat> was bonds uh, with the same rating, same uh, priority, but uh, spread uh, close to. So we basically got a similarly sized sample uh, that had uh, included uh, the bonds as close to that median as we could to get to the number required for the sample. And we chose an observation period in which the spread of the high yield index as a whole was fairly stable. So uh, we weren't getting a bias because 
uh, risk premiums were going up or going down during that, uh, that period. And what we found was that the um, incidence of upgrading in the bonds that the market said uh, was all, were already B3 or better was 45.5%. In the control sample, it was only 17.4%, and that was statistically different at 95% uh, confidence level. <clears throat> so it does um, support the idea that the market identifies bonds, and so you could say by an objective standard, they ought to be upgraded. Uh, the rating agencies are slow in upgrading them, uh, and that may be that there's less urgency about it. If the, market, the company's not coming to market right now, they may not be at the top of their uh, uh, priorities and or they may be a little bit uh, conservative and concerned about upgrading and then having something go wrong and having to go back down so they may drag their feet a little bit on the um, on the upgrading um, there uh, there were uh, four issues of three issuers in the same uh, and that's a mistake success control I should write read uh, test sample that actually widened by more than the index as a whole did so you could say there were also some errors on the part of the market uh, or else uh, conditions just change in such a way that the, uh, that confidence was no longer um, warranted. Uh, but uh, on the whole, I think it does support that complaint uh, that um, some of the issuers uh, should, be, uh, should be upgraded. But I think it's very important <clears throat> to uh, note the direction of this error. It's saying that the rating agencies are rating the companies lower than they should be. So if the companies are bribing the rating agencies and getting this result, they should demand their money back uh, because what they want is to get rated higher than they deserve to be. Um, so uh, uh, just a, one, a little bit of um, a sideline on this also is that a lot of the commentary I've talked about is coming from practitioners and there may be a tendency to say, well, um, these people are in the market, they should know what they're talking about. And uh, they do, uh, which isn't the same as saying they're going to tell the truth uh, or be uh, completely objective about things. Uh, really, when you look at it, there are some strong incentives for most of the other market participants to criticize the rating agencies. First of all, of course, the, um, uh, the investment banks who uh, will say, uh, you know, will go in and, uh, and, and they will sometimes market themselves on this basis to say, well, if you do your deal with us, we'll get you upgraded. And uh, then they fail to deliver on that. Uh, who are they going to blame other than the rating agencies and saying, well, those guys don't know what they're doing. And, you know, look, here's a, here's a case of, of um, uh, well, they used to say, grants. You know, did you realize only 20 years ago there was a bond rated triple B that defaulted uh, uh, at the time? And I said, well, as if that had some bearing on the thousands of other issuers, you know, some ancient history. Now Enron, which is a greatly misunderstood story, also uh, will, for I think a number of years to come, to be the poster child for here's the proof that the ratings were wrong. And I, if, if you like, I go into more detail about why that story is not correct. <laughs> Um, so they, they have a, 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 an agenda there, clearly. Now, you might think, well, the money managers, uh, you know, they would uh, certainly want to be objective and fair about it. But in fact, um, they have a problem, uh, which is that uh, they, uh, particularly if they're in the speculative grade area, they're going into potential uh, clients and saying, you know, our fee uh, is half a percentage point a year, and so on, uh, and the uh, client, uh, potential client is saying, what? That's exorbitant. That's highway robbery. We have another manager who's managing tre treasury bills for us and charging us, you know, uh, uh, 10 basis points. So how can you dare to su suggest such an exorbitant uh, uh, fee structure? And the response to it is, well, we have a team of analysts that we have to pay in order to make good uh, credit selection. So we, ha we have to have that uh, team of analysts. And the response to that is, well, no, you don't. You have the ratings. You can rely on the ratings. So. Uh, it's very important for the companies, uh, the money managers, to disprove the idea that the ratings have any uh, reliability at all, and they're always looking for examples, uh, that, you know, the bizarre outlier in the sample, to prove that the entire rating process is flawed and useless. And, um, and of course, the uh, traders and salespeople are right in the act, too. One of my uh, great uh, memories of uh, working on Wall Street was the sales manager for a high yield group. Uh, coming uh, and, at a morning meeting and going through the positions that they were trying to buy or sell and saying, well, uh, uh, and getting a response from one of the salesmen saying, my 
client won't buy that issue because it has a triple C rating. And he went on for about five minutes lambasting both the salesman and the rating agencies and saying, as everybody knows, the ratings are completely worthless and citing chapter and verse about how terrible they were. And then without pausing for breath and saying, now our next position is uh, uh, XYZ Corporation and they should buy it because it's about to be upgraded. <laughs> uh, and I asked the salesman, uh, one of the salesmen afterwards, did anyone notice the uh, inconsistency in that? And they said, oh yeah, we don't take any of that seriously. Was, um, but uh, unfortunately, uh, at least the unsuspecting uh, 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 investors may take it seriously. Uh, they, they shouldn't. Well, uh, so to recap, I uh, explained why the issuer pay model is not a problem in corporate ratings, even though there is evidence that it was in mortgage-backed ratings. I'm not sure that problem has really been solved, uh, despite all the reform measures. Um, and I presented evidence to support my claim that the issuer pay uh, is not a um, problem uh, in the corporate ratings. The final point I promised to make is that the issuer pay model is a problem in corporate underwriting. So first let me address the obvious objection that the issuers do not pay the underwriter. So how can there be an issuer pay problem? Uh, the, uh, uh, underwriter buys the bonds at a discount from the issuer and resells them to the investor. So uh, the, the form of it, at least, is that the underwriters are paid by the investors. Now, the substance is quite different. Uh, the reality is that the underwriter is the one that select, or the uh, issuer is the one that selects the underwriter, and uh, clearly. Uh, the reason to select an underwriter is the hope that you'll get a lower cost of capital by going with that particular underwriter. Now the problem is that, um, although it may have been different at one point in the speculative grade area, uh, nowadays for the most part, and at least for the uh, issuers that are well known, have bonds trading in the secondary market, or are similar enough to others that are trading that you can come to a pretty objective standard of where they should trade, there really isn't a lot of ability to uh, compete on the basis of we're going to get you a better rate. Um, there is a, uh, an ability to uh, compete on the basis of we can find new loopholes uh, to help you take advantage of the investors in ways that haven't been thought of previously. We have a uh, staff of people employed full time in coming up with those gimmicks and, um, and, uh, and particularly until the investors figure it out, uh, this will be a great advantage to you because you'll get greater flexibility under the covenants than you would have um, if you did uh, this deal with another uh, underwriter who hadn't thought up this gimmick. Now these, uh, these things get figured out pretty quickly and copied, uh, so uh, there's a limited uh, period in which you can uh, have an edge, but this is uh, really uh, an important basis of, of, um, uh, of competition. Now the, this is the picture of the underwriters as they would like to be perceived in other words, um, you know, we're just uh, like a football referee. We whistle uh, the play, stop, we mark where the ball uh, was down and call for the next play, and we hope that uh, uh, in the end, the score will reflect the relative strengths of the uh, two teams. Uh, we have no influence on it. And if, uh, you know, this could very well work that way um, but uh, in the market, but what, what would happen, do you suppose, if instead of the league selecting the referee, it was the home team that got to choose who the referee for their game would be, and uh, those who got chosen more frequently were going to uh, work more and get compensated more. You might suspect that the refereeing would start to get skewed a little bit. And uh, that's really the, the uh, so this is not the image to have in mind of uh, the underwriters, just the simply, uh, simply a, an honest broker that stands in the middle and lets the market find the clearing price. Um, and you know, if it were true that that's all that the underwriter did, uh, why go to any trouble deciding which one to pick? Uh, they will all get the same results. So uh, you might just uh, you know, flip a coin, uh, with that, which is clearly not what happens. So um, here is, again, some background about the high yield bond underwriting market that leads the result, to the results that I'm going to show you in a moment. <clears throat> um, the investors are very fragmented. Um, uh, they have no ability, even though there's talk from time to time, you know, after something really egregious happens to them, they say, we have to uh, form a union, we have to uh, form a cartel of buyers. Well, I think all of you know from economics that a cartel with hundreds of different uh, 
uh, participants doesn't work very well. There's you know just an in inevitable uh, cheating that goes on unless you have one big player that dominates it. You know cartels just don't work very well. So they're uh, relatively powerless compared to the oligopoly of the underwriters. Now uh, it's open uh, to new competitors, but the barriers to competition are fairly high because to be an underwriter, uh, in, particularly in the high yield market, you really have to have a whole team of uh, salespeople, traders, bankers, analysts. It, uh, it's not something you can produce overnight just by going out and making a lot of job offers in order to get that team functioning well. Uh, it takes an investment of several years, and uh, of course these people are, are not uh, cheap uh, to hire. So, <clears throat> um, uh, at any, so it really to be in this business in a serious way, you have to have a market share of something like 10% to pay the rent on all of uh, these uh, resources. So just by arithmetic, you're going to have a limited number of significant underwriters at any given time. It's usually about a half a dozen. The universe is not totally constant from one decade to the next, but relatively little turnover. So with that structure, um, the uh, problem that arises is that if you say, all right, uh, Goldman Sachs or Merrill Lynch or uh, B of A Merrill Lynch or someone did a deal that's really terrible, it's just outrageous, uh, I'm going to punish them by refusing to do business with them. This is called putting them in the penalty box. And this is a meaningless sanction uh, because uh, since there are only half a dozen major underwriters and you have a lot of capital coming in and sometimes that you need to put, put to work, you really can't boycott a particular underwriter. If anything, it's the other side. They can boycott you that if uh, they, you don't play ball with them and say, well, you're not going to be uh, offered the opportunity to participate in our next deal. Um, so the only one that winds up suffering is the bond salesman at that firm who doesn't get to write any tickets with you for a while. But it does make the portfolio managers feel better. They say, well, we showed them. We, we, we really uh, punished them. It has no impact. Um, uh, the, the, the competition for fees is really, it's not really the basis on which competition is, uh, is done in the high yield market or in the corporate market generally. Um, there, as I mentioned earlier, there's not a lot of uncertainty about where most issues should be priced. Um, so uh, you have to find another basis for uh, offering value to the uh, issuer and um, there isn't really that much difference in their ability to execute the uh, issue and get it at, price the, the, at the level that it ought to, ought to come to market at. So the um, result is that the uh, underwriters compete for the mandates to lead these new issues on the basis of achieving uh, more issuer friendly terms. Now, <clears throat> let me just mention a study done in 2013 by uh, Christian Andres, Andre Betzer, and Peter Limbach, uh, all from uh, Germany, uh, looking at the U.S. high yield market that finds that the bonds underwritten by the top three underwriters, who you would think would be the ones with the greatest reputational capital, actually have a higher probability of being downgraded or uh, defaulting than bonds underwritten by the other, uh, other firms. Uh, kind of exactly the opposite of what you'd uh, predict according to most uh, established financial theory. And they further found that the market is well aware of this, that the issues of those top three underwriters yield more normalized for every other factor that affects the pricing than the issues of the other underwriters. And uh, they attribute this to a change. Now they didn't really go back and study the earlier period, but their uh, thesis is that uh, this situation has come about as a result of uh, the repeal of uh, Glass-Steagall, which heightened the c competition in the corporate bond underwriting market by bringing the commercial banks into the picture, and uh, that as a result of this, they've had to um, give up the uh, protection of their reputational capital in order to you know, scrape for business and be more willing to uh, offer uh, un unfair uh, terms, uh, you know, for terms uh, too fair uh, to the uh, to the issuers, and there's been a, a steady deterioration. I think there is some support for the idea that it has accelerated um, the, the downtrend, and I think this is more than a cyclical trend, but really a steady deterioration. Now, in the 70s, when the high yield market as we know it today began, <clears throat> uh, 1977 was the first year in which there was one billion dollars in aggregate of uh, new issue uh, activity in the uh, U.S. high yield market. Um, the 
reality, although the others have written about why this happened, the arguments that don't make any sense, they say, well, at this time, investors were concerned about getting the most yield they could. I said, well, what were they doing in the earlier period? <laughs> they weren't doing their job if they were doing anything other than trying to get the highest yield. So the, the real change that came about uh, was twofold. It was the rise of the uh, mutual bond funds, some of which focused on lower rated bonds. There were tremendous inflows at a time when there was actually a shrinkage in the supply in the mid-70s of uh, below investment grade bonds. So all of a sudden there was an incentive to make a bigger business out of something that had been a very small level of activity, two or three issues a year of new bonds by companies rated less than triple B. But this became uh, a big focus of Wall Street. And uh, from the issuer standpoint, why would they do this instead of continuing to do private placements as they had done previously? Well, they came and said, we'll do the issue without call protection and without covenants. They said, oh, sign me up. And, and you know, this is the story that the uh, proponents of the high yield market don't want to tell, but I can tell you this was a big motivation. I heard issuers say that explicitly. They said when the Drexel Burnham banker showed up and said we didn't have to have covenants, we said, where do we sign? You know, so this, this was the, uh, those, those were the real reasons for the rise of the market. So at, at first, I mean, these deals were egregious. The investors, who uh, many of them had come from the investment grade corporate market where there were covenants uh, not uh, that uh, strict and they really hadn't ever mattered that much. Um, and um, they uh, uh, you know, weren't conscious of the uh, tremendous incentive to companies in the high yield market to call their bonds if interest rates went down. They were able to refinance and uh, gave you essentially no uh, protection against that. There was a, um, an investor uh, backlash against this after some horrendous experience with bonds. Uh, most importantly, companies that took advantage of a uh, kind of a little known feature in the um, uh, SEC regulations, which is that if you uh, uh, have uh, fewer than 300 public holders, uh, you're not actually required to file financial statements. Um, so they would come out with a prospectus, and the expectation, of course, was, oh, well, okay, like every other deal we buy, we're going to get a quarterly report. And then they would um, call, and they'd say, hey, I didn't get my report. Let me call up the trustee. They called the trustee and said, uh, I didn't get my report. And they said, who are you? And they said, well, you know, we're the uh, such, such institution. Was, I don't see you listed because uh, these bonds are held in street name. And uh, in any case, there are fewer than 300 public holders, so the company is you know, not issuing statements anymore. So uh, you can imagine how valuable your bonds were in the market when no one else that you could, might sell it to could get any information about how the company was doing. Well, this was so outrageous that there was a successful uprising by the investors and uh, some uh, meaningful call protection came into the bonds at that time and another feature that came in was anti-layering covenants uh, because prior to that companies would issue bonds and you'd say well I'm, I'm the most senior uh, guy in the capital structure with my senior unsecured bonds and then all of a sudden there was a, uh, a senior security issue that came and you were pushed down uh, so uh, bonds started to get that feature and the, the solution to the uh, non-issuance of uh, financial statements was they put in a covenant which became standard that uh, whether or not the company is required to issue by SEC regulations, they will provide a quarterly statement, uh, sort of uh, the equivalent of a 10Q whether they're required to by law or not. Um, but since then, it's really been uh, relentless gains by the issuers. Uh, Drive-bys are deals where without a roadshow, they just announce they're going to do a deal. Later that same day, it comes to market. Uh, no real time for the investors to look at it. But of course, the deals, and this is a very important thing to keep in mind, deals don't come to market when money is flowing out of the, the bond funds. Uh, and, it's, it, and it isn't a good steady inflow. They tend to be big inflows and then big outflows. Well, if they're only issuing when money is coming in and the uh, portfolio manager's biggest worry is that they'll wind up sitting with 10% cash and then get criticism that you're charging uh, you know, a, a high yield management fee for managing uh, cash. Uh, well, if, they're, if their main motive is to put the money to work, they're going to buy whatever terms the underwriters are offering at that time. And if no deals are coming at the time when the bargaining power is on the side of the investors, this is why I talk about the opposite of the Lake Wobegon effect. The average deal is worse than average in quality because they only come to market when the terms greatly favor the issuers. Um, uh, clawbacks, uh, which was sort of a take back 
the real clawback was uh, the, uh, from the um, uh, call pro protection that had been provided earlier. They said, well, we can't call the bond uh, prior to five years after issuance, but if we uh, issue equity, uh, that improves the situation for the issue uh, for the investor because now there's more uh, equity beneath you in the capital structure. So you won't mind if we uh, call 35% of that issue. Well, when I ran the numbers, it was pretty clear that uh, it was not a fair or an even trade. You were definitely worse off, but the bankers have a, a great skill at uh, telling that story with a straight face. Um, then along came 144As, uh, which uh, uh, were a benefit to the capital markets in saying, all right, you don't have to go through the registration process before selling the deal, but they were typically done with a provision that said, once the deal is sold, we will, within a stated period of time, register the deal or else replace your, your bond with another, a registered deal so that even though uh, we're taking advantage of the window in the market, we don't have to wait for three weeks of registration in order to take advantage of a rate opportunity, um, you will wind up with a registered deal. But there was some risk that the, the, the registration would fail because of some development that occurred in the company and that did happen in a few occasions. So there was no real benefit to the investor in this. And then uh, more recently, they've come with 144As for life, um, which uh, eliminate that um, uh, uh, you know, re re uh, registration requirement. Uh, now, it's not as much of a problem if a company has other securities that are requiring it to, uh, uh, you know, to, to file the uh, 10 Qs. But uh, for some of the smaller issues, issuers uh, can be a significant problem. Um, and there has been significant uh, quality uh, deterioration in covenants, and uh, that's a big topic, a lot of features. But you know, a big part of covenants is the carve-outs. Say we cannot, the company cannot issue more debt uh, unless it, after the issuance of debt on a pro forma basis, it meets such and such a fixed charge coverage test, except for, <laughs> and then a long list of uh, situations in which they can issue debt despite that rule. And as those carve-outs get bigger and bigger. Uh, the uh, meaning of that covenant eventually disappears entirely. Um, so, uh, very important, there's no such thing as a win-win in the corporate bond underwriting market. Uh, there might be cases elsewhere in finance where both parties actually benefit, but it's really a zero-sum game, and uh, I would say that the issuers with the uh, help of the underwriters are winning. And um, just some evidence of uh, uh, how this is playing out. Uh, Moody's publishes a covenant quality score where they rate each of the major covenants in each issue and then combine those into an overall rating for the issue. And then uh, following a suggestion I made to them, they put those together as an index and publish on a monthly basis the trend of covenant quality in the market as a whole. Um, uh, we do our own ver uh, a variation on that because the Moody's version of it is somewhat contaminated by a change in ratings mix from month to month, uh, which uh, it, it affects the results because the lowest rated issuers uh, tend to have the strongest covenant. So if you have a deterioration in the ratings mix in a given month, it'll look like covenant quality went up, but that's kind of illusory. So we uh, filter out that effect. But on a quarterly basis, the numbers don't to be, tend to be too much different. But what you see is a clear deterioration. If I change the scale to eliminate the one and two, because you would never have a period where the average quality was as high as that, you'd see more clearly the decline in covenant quality from the uh, beginning date of this series being available. And it's now at, uh, just about the lowest level that it's been since this uh, series began. Also, I mentioned the 144A for life, so which there, there's no possible benefit for the investor in this. It's all to the benefit of the issuer. And that has really skyrocketed in the last couple of years. You know, half of the issuance is now coming in this form. So a clear victory and uh, for the issuers, a clear loss for the investors. So uh, the overall conclusion is that in the corporate bond market, the issuer pay conflict uh, to be concerned about is underwriting and not in credit ratings. And uh, perhaps that will spur uh, some of the rumors, some of your colleagues to uh, explore these issues further. So I, I think we have time for a, a few questions if um, there are some. So let me start here. I'll bring the microphone around oh, if you'd like. Oh, okay.